Okay, let's get down to the earth, to the dirty stuff. Never mind the sausage. You see the guys who are driving? Does a nuclear physicist believe in little green men? Well, they're usually little. They're rarely green. Whether they're men or women, we don't really know, or neither, perhaps. I don't know. But yes, on many an occasion, earthlings have seen little guys or gals alongside the craft they see on the ground. Landing trace cases. Ted Phillips down in Missouri has been at this for over 40 years. Last time I talked to him, about three weeks ago, he's now got 5,200 cases from 95 countries. And I hate to say it, but frankly, you read the first couple hundred and it's dull. Same damn thing is happening all over the planet. People see these craft on or near the ground, and after it leaves, one finds burn circles, burn rings, landing gear marks, footprints. About a sixth of these cases involve reports of little beings. People say, how come there's no physical evidence? Well, look for it, darn it. Don't tell me there's no physical evidence. Uh, next slide. This is one of those physical trace cases. This is Delphos, Kansas. Uh, Ronnie Johnson, age 17, was finishing his chores for the evening over to the left, taking care of the sheep. Looks up, and here's a saucer sitting right over this area here, about 10 feet in diameter brilliantly lit, he's paralyzed, can't move. Neither can his dog, which is kind of interesting. He's staring at this thing, finally this thing takes off. The boy goes into the house, tells his parents, they come out and they see this thing leaving slowly. They go out, this thing is glowing, bottom of the tree is glowing, a board is glowing. They call the sheriff's office, they come out the next day, Check for radiation. That's all everybody worries about. Make sure it's not radioactive. Uh, it wasn't. Ted Phillips hears about this story. The guy who's in the neighboring state of Missouri hears about this case. Goes out there, talks to the Johnson family, including Ronnie, the boy. Sends me samples of the soil. And let's look at the next slide. You'll see some of those. Ring soil on the right, normal soil from a few feet away on the left. Please note the sophisticated soil retention device. I had somebody tell me he couldn't believe anything I said because of that darn paper plate. I said when I was at the University of Chicago, there was a Nobel Prize winning physics experiment on which a key piece of equipment was supported on an empty coffee can. If they can use a coffee can, because it was the right height, obviously, I can use a paper plate. I had good analysis done. The ring soil has far too high a level of soluble minerals, probably from microwaves, to support plant growth. And for a few years, it didn't grow anything. Normal stuff, soil grows stuff fine. Ted's got over 5,000 cases. Now, they haven't all been tested. But enough have been tested to say something crazy is going on here. Let's look at the next slide. Famous abduction case, Betty and Barney Hill and their dog, it's not a little alien. Uh, you're probably all familiar with the case. Betty and Barney driving along the, the mountains, the hills of New Hampshire, September 19th, 1961. Late at night, Betty spots something strange in the sky. She tells Barney, must be a UFO, Barney. Ah, oh, come on, Betty. It's probably a Piper Cub. Don't worry about it. Uh, they keep driving, and it goes along. They see it in front of the old man of the mountain, which was a New Hampshire symbol until it fell into the local lake. And it was one and a half times the size of the natural bust that's in the mountains there, which would make it about 72 feet. But of course, the noisy negativists have later shown that clearly it must have been Jupiter, which is pretty neat if you can get Jupiter to be as small as it is alongside the old man of the mountain. You know, makes no sense. Uh, anyway, they keep driving. This thing comes close to them. They stop the car. Barney gets out. He takes his binoculars. He's looking at this thing. Then it comes much closer to them. It scares the heck out of him. He's standing there looking up at this thing. Two double row of lights. There are window, double row of windows, but light coming through the windows. There are beings on board who seem to be doing things, a crew. And Barney suddenly gets scared. One of these guys is looking at him strongly. He pulls the binoculars away, breaks the strap. That's how upset he was. Dashes back to the car, yells at Betty, they're going to capture us. 
drive off, and he did two things that Barney would never, normally never have done. He goes from the primary road to a secondary road, and then to a tertiary road, a dirt road. And then, and at first I don't remember this part, uh, there's a crew of, a bunch of guys in the road. They stop the car, some on each side of the car, they each take Barney and Betty, take them along a little path there and up into the craft, which had landed in the one place in that area that's big enough to take, say, an 80-foot diameter craft. It was Sandy. I've been there. Uh, up ramps, kept in separate rooms, treated as specimens, put a needle in here, scrape a little skin there, in, in separate rooms now. Uh, pretty scary stuff. It's not that they were maltreated, but who knows what's going to happen. These are little guys. Uh, and one point I want to get at about this case, there's, there's an interesting book outside. The woman who did most of the work is Betty's niece, Kathleen Marden, who did 85% of the work. They put my name first on the book because they said it'll sell more. Now, what do you say when the publisher tells you that? You don't say, well, it's not right. I should have, you know, we talked about it. Okay, if, if that makes it sell more because I'm better known, we'll do it. That's because I'm older. You understand. Uh, anyway. Uh, Betty, under hypnosis, it's a long involved story, but under hypnosis, let's look at the next slide, describes how she's trying to, Betty had guts. She'd talk to anybody. And she's asking the leader of this crew, where are you from? I know you're not from around here, understatement of the month, you understand. <laughs> and he shows her, I'll call it a three-dimensional model. Points, probably a hologram, but points of light, supposedly stars, connected with lines. And she was asked by Dr. Benjamin Simon under hypnosis if she could remember what it looked like. She said yes, and he gave her a post-hypnotic suggestion, if and only if she could remember it accurately. Please draw it later on. There it is. And so she asked him, well, where are you on the map? Wise guy alien, do you know where you are on the map? No, I don't know anything about astronomy. Well, how can I tell you where I'm from if you don't know where you're at? End of discussion. This is weird. Dr. Benjamin Simon, who did the hypnosis, who's the strongest part of the story, because he was a world-class expert on treating what today we call post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Then it was shell shock war veterans. He ran a hospital for 3,000 guys who came out of World War II, shell shock, if you will. And the Army made a movie, Let There Be Light, starring Dr. Simon, showing how he brought people back to living sort of a normal life. You know, your buddy's head gets blown off next to you. That's a little hard to integrate into your everyday life procedures. And Dr. Simon said, in writing, the emotional reaction of Betty and Barney as each separately relived part of his experience, there were 10 sessions each, was every bit as great as that of any of the shell shock war veterans he worked with. And he had to stop one session each for fear that they wouldn't be able to handle it physiologically. Total terror, in other words. Uh, now, the question is, what the heck does that map mean? Now, fortunately, Dr. Simon knew nothing about flying saucers, but he knew a great deal about helping people work through traumatic experiences. Uh, what does it mean? I mean, there are no reference points. There are a lot of stars out there. It's well over a thousand stars within 55 light years of here. Which one is which? Well, a brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish did something nobody else had ever done. She built a total of 27 different three-dimensional models of our local galactic neighborhood. The old hands-on approach. Beads strung on fish line in a big frame. Tough work because the hard part was getting the distance data to the stars. The, the basic idea was very straightforward. Look at a three-dimensional model of our neighborhood and see if we can find a three-dimensional pattern that matches the two-dimensional pattern that's drawn there. Sounds straightforward. It isn't because we had lousy distance data. Astronomers weren't going anywhere. Doesn't matter, when you're looking at a star, all you need is two coordinates, two angles. And whether it's 20 light years away or 30 light years away, it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to find a pattern for comparison, it matters entirely. So 
at first she had no results. She kept eliminating stars because there were astronomers who were saying, well, only this kind of star would have planets. You know, there was a long period of time, not too long ago, when we said there aren't any other stars with planets. We're special. We're on top of the heap. Well, she, as she whittled away, finally she got down to about 25 stars. There was the pattern. Angle for angle, line length for line length, matching what Betty had drawn. It was a great day for Marjorie. I was asked to help her uh, communicate about it by the head of APRO, the Aerophenomena Research Organization. I visited her, Marjorie, in Ohio. She was a, a school teacher, member of Mensa, incidentally, had a bachelor's degree in biology, uh, very bright lady. Let's look, look at the next slide. There's Marjorie. She also is a sculptress. That's your typical zeta reticulin. I haven't told you where that is yet, but you can see it was taken a few years ago. My beard is a little uh, darker than it is now. And I was a lot younger than I am now. I was about 1970 or so, 71 maybe. Anyway, let's look at the next slide. This is one of her models, about three foot on the side, this cube. Hard to get it through doorways, incidentally. <laughs> that was one problem. Uh, the sun is in the middle somewhere. Let's look at the next slide. Here's the sun, the base stars. Let's look at the next slide, which will have names. These have all been changed, so we've got much better distance data now. The Hipparchos satellite measured distances to about a couple of million stars. But sun's up there. All the stars connected with lines are the right kind for planets and life. All the right kind for planets and life in this three-dimensional volume of space are part of the pattern. And the base stars are Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. That's the constellation reticulum, which means the net in Latin. Not that I speak Latin, but that's what they tell me it means. Uh, and it's only now, we know, 39 light years away. But it's a very special pair of stars. And this was not known to be the case before Marjorie's work. Those two stars are the closest to each other pair of sun-like stars in our entire local neighborhood. Next star over, 4.3 light years, is it? Alpha Centauri. Uh, these two stars from each other are less than an eighth of a light year apart. They're 35 times closer to each other than the sun is the next star over. We're out in the boondocks. These guys got next door neighbors. And they're a cool billion years older than the sun. And they're so close that if you look from one at the other, the other star is visible all day long. And it doesn't take very fancy instruments to measure stuff about the planets around those stars to say that there are planets there, et cetera, et cetera. And with a billion year head start, I'm sure you can figure out something better than nuclear fusion to get between the stars. More incentive when you got a next door neighbor than long ways away. Very exciting piece of work, uh, outstanding as a matter of fact. Uh, Marjorie was pretty special. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I wrote an article in Saga magazine. I suggested to the editor of Astronomy magazine then, Terry Dickinson, that he do an article. He talked to a bunch of people and did an article, December 1974, got more response than anything they'd ever published before that. He carried about 11 letters over the next year. Then he put together this 32-page full-color booklet, sold 10,000 copies immediately, which is unheard of in astronomy. And then Carl Sagan's lawyer threatened to sue him because his name was on the front, where it belonged with the other people who had letters here. They threatened a lawsuit. It turned out the publisher, we didn't know it at the time, had a brain tumor and he was dead less than a year later. He was not the kind of guy who would cave into a lawsuit threat, but he was then. He was not quite right. Anyway, they, because I had suggested the article in the first place, they made me an order, offer I couldn't refuse, and I wound up with 18,000 copies in my garage in California. I don't have any left. I moved them to Fredericton, New Brunswick, and they were gone pretty quick. I wish I did have a bunch more. It's online if you want to go look for it, but a lot of color and stuff. Anyway, the same magazine publishes this stupid article in the current issue by Phil Plate, The Science Behind UFOs, which has no science in it. 
Strange world we live in. Anyway, next slide. Your typical zeta reticulin, as I said. This is based on Barney's description under hypnosis. Next slide. There's our book, Kathleen Martin and I. As I said, she did 85% of the work. And yes, I did meet Betty and Barney, Betty many times, Barney six months before he died. Uh, I was very favorably impressed, to say the least. Uh, this goes into what happened to Betty after the big fuss back then when the first book came out, The Interrupted Journey by John Fuller. And some of you may remember, some of you are old enough to remember, the 1975 uh, television movie starring James Earl Jones as Barney called uh, The UFO Incident. Uh, and last I heard, James was still alive. I was a consultant on that movie. Would you believe that Universal got my name from the Air Force? They're supposed to give people the names of a scientist in the neighborhood. I was living in Southern California at the time. It seems rather strange somehow. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's look at the next slide, please. 